I can have your attention, please. I need to ask that everyone find a seat. Good afternoon, my name is Ken Foster and I'm the head of the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue. It's my honor to welcome you to the 37th annual James C. Snyder Memorial Lecture. Dr. Jim Snyder was born on March 31st, 1930 in Ontario, Canada. He completed his bachelor's degree at Ontario College of Agriculture in 1953, after which he came to Purdue for graduate study in agricultural economics where he received his master's degree in 1956 and his doctoral degree in 1962. Jim Snyder demonstrated extraordinary initiative and creativity in graduate research. He became excited about the potential use of management decision models for agribusiness. In recognition of his excellence in research, Jim received a PhD dissertation award from the American Farm Economics Association, the first such award earned by a Purdue student. Upon completion of graduate study, Jim became a member of the faculty in agricultural economics at Purdue and began a brilliant teaching and research career, attaining the rank of professor in 1969. He was named Teacher of the Year in recognition of his outstanding undergraduate instruction in business management. His pioneering research contributed greatly to the knowledge about practical applicability of quantitative approaches to decision making in the management of agribusiness firms. His design of functional programs for management decision making is well known and his consulting activities gave him insights and opportunities to make his work relevant to everyday business needs as well as the training of his students. Jim Snyder was also a master teacher of graduate students. He gave the type of personalized and rigorous training which qualified them for leading positions in business, education, and government. He made research exciting and students responded with hard work, devotion, and admiration. Students wanted to work with Jim Snyder. Jim Snyder will be, will be remembered as a brilliant colleague whose work, standards, and style are a challenge to all. Please join me in a moment of silent remembrance and contemplation of Dr. Snyder's life and accomplishments. Thank you. The James C. Snyder Memorial Lecture is the signature event of the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. The lectures were established in February 1975 as an appropriate memorial to a distinguished faculty member. Funds to support such a memorial are contributed by friends and corporations who wish to encourage the continuation of the professional efforts of Jim Snyder during his brief but brilliant career. The purposes of the lecture are to stimulate the intellectual environment of the department, to recognize the professional contributions of Professor, Professor Snyder, to contribute to the department's efforts to enhance and motivate excellence in all of its mission areas by bringing to the Purdue campus individuals who can offer unique contributions, and to broaden the perspective of students by exposing them to outstanding professionals from other institutions. We also take this opportunity to recognize key accomplishments in our department and to recognize some key alumni and friends. For those of you familiar with this celebration, you'll notice that we've reordered the program a bit this year to accommodate the tight travel schedule of our distinguished speaker. However, before moving to the lecture, I do want to recognize a couple of key individuals who have joined us this afternoon. It's truly an honor to have with us the late Dr. Snyder's wife, Mrs. Mary Ruth Snyder, and their daughter, Betsy Kochmer. Mary Ruth and Betsy, would you please stand so that we can show our appreciation. We have a small token of our appreciation for Mrs. Snyder that we will be presented to her uh, at a private reception later this afternoon. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Thomas Honig. Dr. Honig is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. He directs the Federal Reserve activities in the 10th Federal Reserve District. Dr. Honig assumed the role of President on October 1st, 1991. He is the longest serving of the 12 current regional Federal Reserve Bank presidents 
and he is, always, he is also the longest tenured member of the system's Federal Market Committee, which has authority over U.S. monetary policy. Dr. Honig joined the bank in 1973 and was the bank's senior officer in banking supervision during one of its most tumultuous periods, the banking crisis of the 1980s. During the recent financial crisis and its aftermath, he has been especially vocal about the regulation of the financial industry, the need for addressing so-called too-big-to-fail institutions, and the role of monetary policy. The New York Times wrote on December 13, 2010, and I quote, as the longest serving Fed president, his views are shaped by the uncontrolled inflation of the 1970s, the spike in land prices that followed, and the ensuing banking and thrift crises. In his unwavering dissents and his wariness of Wall Street, his views seem rooted in the agrarian and populist tradition that is mistrustful of concentration of power, end quote. Dr. Honig is a native of Fort Madison, Iowa. He earned a bachelor's degree in economics and mathematics from Benedictine College and a master's and PhD degrees in economics from Iowa State, for which we'll forgive him. <laughs> His lecture this afternoon is entitled, Sowing the Seeds, Monetary Policy in the Ag Economy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming this year's Snyder Lecturer, Dr. Thomas Honig. Well, thank you very much, um, and thank you for inviting me here. I'm, I'm just delighted. Uh, this is um, an extremely enjoyable uh, thing for me to do, given that I did graduate from Iowa State, and I'm happy to uh, share our great, vast knowledge from Iowa State with you here today. <laughs> uh, we have a lot in common, don't we? Uh, engineering schools, ag schools, uh, and a lot of experience. And that's what I want to do this afternoon is <clears throat> kind of outline for you the context of uh, my views on monetary policy and to some extent kind of have it described for you uh, what I think about in, in some of the agricultural events going on right now in a small way. Um, I want to, first of all, make sure everyone has, we're, we're all on the same page, and I'm going to try and do this uh, without uh, causing you to go to sleep, because we have finished lunch and it is Friday afternoon, so I'm going to try and to give you a sense and then it'll open up for questions. As was noted, I have been uh, a systematic dissenter in the sense of not uh, agreeing with the majority of the Federal Open Market Committee, which is responsible for monetary policy in this country. Uh, I systematically did dissent, and, and there's really three reasons over the course of last year that I did. The first reason was that when we started this year out, I was concerned about having language that said we will keep interest rate exceptionally low for an extended period of time. I didn't think in a recovery that was appropriate any longer. And then I dissented because I think in the, in the second go around that we had that zero interest rates in recovery were necessarily in our long run best interest. And finally I dissented in the third series uh, because I, uh, I was against continuing to ease through what we called quantitative easing, that is the purchase of long-term assets to inject additional liquidity into the economy. I don't mean to suggest that I'm right, but uh, I felt pretty strongly about these matters. Now I want to start uh, from the crisis, uh, not to the causes of the crisis, but the events around it, because I think that helps set the context for why I'm concerned about the policies that are continuing at this time. At the time of the crisis, we really did have a liquidity uh, uh, freeze up in not only the U.S. economy, but in the global economy. And for that reason, I was very supportive of providing liquidity into the markets, uh, providing liquidity to the banking industry that needed it, providing liquidity to uh, the markets broadly because we purchased assets, long-term assets, mortgage-backed securities to provide uh, a way to relieve that part of the industry as well. I, was, I agreed with making loans, almost a trillion dollars of loans to financial institutions. And that was the crisis 
and it was important that we do that. That's what central banks are about. Now, what you do in those situations, though, you do begin to uh, rebalance the market. Because at zero interest rates, you really do favor debtors, the financial industry and other debtors over savers, and you begin to have those kinds of effects on the economy as you're doing them for all the right reasons. So the question is, how do you renormalize? When should you rebalance your policy? And it was my conclusion that the recovery started in the third quarter of 2009, so a year after the financial crisis of September 2008, we were beginning to recover. And I was not advocating for tight monetary policy in any sense, but to begin to think about how you allow your policy to renormalize so that your markets and your economy can rebalance. And I thought about that. And so you come then to the fact that, well, what are you trying to accomplish then with a zero interest rate and with uh, a very uh, asset, back, uh, asset purchase program? Well, the reasons are, are, are important and valid in a recovery. You're keeping interest rates low so that you encourage, number one, consumption. Because with interest rates low, you would tend to choose to consume over save because you get so little on your savings. And that helps stimulate the economy, help maintain aggregate demand. With interest rates very low, you hopefully stimulate investment because the cost of capital is lower. You inject liquidity. With that capital, you can invest and rebuild the economy. Very legitimate intended consequences of that accommodative policy. Now, there are also risks to that, uh, negatives that you can actually predict and then unintended consequences that you have to be mindful of. And some of those are the following. With a very low interest rate, you are making a choice of the distribution of wealth in your economy. You are asking the savers of your economy to subsidize the debtors of your economy so that the economy can grow. Legitimate in a crisis, but after the crisis has passed, you need to begin to rethink about, rethink that, because savings is important to the long run advantage of your economy and building your future. It also favors, if you will, high debt organizations, which are, frankly, the largest banks in this country. They were highly debt oriented, highly leveraged uh, in that period. And this, in fact, then asked the saver to subsidize that group so that they can continue to rebuild their equity, rebuild their earnings stream. And they're able to do that because they were, in fact, had access to money at near zero, and then were able to relend that to the government for a positive spread, and thus rebuild their earnings, rebuild their capital over time. But you're asking your savers to help do that for this other group. And you need to be mindful of that as you do it, and try and reverse that and renormalize policy as quickly as possible out uh, of that, because you're giving them a very large advantage. The other thing you do is you begin to, in that environment, to uh, risk at an increasing level the likelihood that you will have inflation in your economy over time. Not immediately, because there's significant uh, excess capacity, which we understand. But over time, as you continue to push that liquidity in, it has to go somewhere either in assets or in prices generally. And then, of course, that has its own set of consequences, doesn't it? Because, number one, inflation uh, has winners and losers like everything else. Inflation, once again, favors the debtor because you're paying back your debt in cheaper dollars. It encourages debt and leverage because you know you'll be paying back your debt in cheaper dollars. It disadvantages those on fixed income because they're, they have saved all their life. Uh, they're going to be conservatively invested because they want to maintain their principal and have enough to live on. And as you move interest rates to zero in the safer assets, that becomes more difficult for them. And so to get returns, they have to increase their risk into the economy and maybe lose more or reduce their consumption or go into their principal uh, because you're supporting the broader economy. 
fine in a crisis, but as the economy returns and strengthens, is that really what you want to do? The other thing with that kind of a policy that you have to be mindful of is it begins to reallocate resources. It affects your choices in the economy as consumers, as investors. And you begin to see it move towards various asset classes or overseas or different locations that are driven by the policy rather than the dynamics of the market and the allocations that the market would otherwise have made. I tell people that you, you tell me, I'll ask you and you tell me what market works best in agriculture or in energy or in the services sector, in the engineering sector, when the service or the product you're selling or trying to buy has a price of zero. How do you make choices with that? How do you allocate resources? Why would it be better or different for credit? And so you begin to build imbalances in the economy. And I tell people as they look at that, let's go back in time to 2003, 2004, and ask what we did then. Think about it. We were worried about a, a stall out in our economy, a return to a double dip recession. And because of that, we made a choice to lower interest rates even further to 1% at that time because unemployment was 6.5% in our economy. The outcome was we did create a credit boom, we did create a housing boom, and we did, in the end, end up with unemployment of nearly 10%. Well-intended policy, rather poor outcome. So let's learn from history and think about it, and then the principles of economics that we're talking about as well as we make choices about how we allocate our resources in our economy. So what are we seeing right now, then? from the policies that we've been following so far. Now, I don't know what the future holds for sure, but I do know that there are inflationary impulses that are in the economy. I see them and you see them on a daily basis. Uh, the, the consumer price index came out today and went up again. Now, so-called core inflation was up modestly, total inflation up rather robustly, but total inflation is what I worry about. It has food, which we all basically want and need, and has energy, which we all basically want and need, and then it has all their services. So I look at total inflation and it's up pretty dramatically. Now, there is a reasonable argument that that is a temporary thing, that it's driven by agriculture and, and unusual events occurring throughout the world, it's by oil and energy and un unusual events around the world, but it's also perhaps related to the fact that monetary policy has accommodated some of those price increases. It's, it's important to at least conceive of that as a possibility uh, as we go forward. Now, where else are we seeing it? Where we are seeing it in asset values. We see it in uh, financial assets. Uh, they're extremely high if you look at bonds and so forth. High yield assets that are so important, we actually see them trading at yields never, uh, never so low uh, until recently. But here in our part of the world, in the Midwest, we're seeing it in a very important asset called uh, agricultural real estate and commodity prices. Now, for the moment, for the moment, that makes us in the Midwest and us in agriculture winners. And it feels good. I like it. But what about the long run? Because right now, though, if those commodity prices are being driven by inflationary impulses in China, inflationary impulses here, moving in demand that will adjust when supplies adjust or when monetary policy is changed, uh, that's a temporary event. The other thing about it is, if you look at land values, it's also driven by interest rates, right? By what we call the discount rate or the cap rate. And we know that when that's very low, assets tend to appreciate. And so being near zero, uh, they've appreciated. And even in the lending on land, it's lower than its historic norm. We've seen loans made, and maybe you have as well, as low as 3 maybe 4%, when the normal lending period or history has been interest rates at 7 and 7.5% 7 .5 average. So we've artificially held those rates down, and we've seen agricultural land go from $5,000 an acre to $7,000 an acre 
to $8,000 to $10,000, and now it's even looking to move beyond that. Now, that's perhaps where it's supposed to be. I doubt it, especially with interest rates as low as it is. And if interest rates rise, we could lose a third of the value of that land in a very short period of time. And now, the other part of low interest rates is that it encourages over time, not today, not immediately, you may be paying cash for it, but over time, it encourages leverage. Because if you can buy that 180 acre with 10,000 an acre cash, you can buy twice that uh, and still have a loan to value ratio of 50%, and gee whiz, you're twice as big. And so it encourages debt. And as that debt builds, when the interest rates rise, then the, then the pressures become greater because you still have to service the debt no matter what the interest rate is, especially if it's higher. Now, you think that can happen. Well, it did happen in the 70s and the 80s in agriculture, but more recently, it happened in what? Something called residential real estate. Now, remember what they said about residential real estate. It can never go down. They promised you it will never go down. But in fact, it did. And the heartache and the, and the difficulties that have come from that is, are almost unmeasurable, unimaginable in some ways. So when you think about that, and I do as a person who's been in the policy realm uh, through the crisis of the 80s and through the Russian debt crisis and through the tech bubble crisis, and then most recently through the residential real estate and commercial housing uh, crisis, you think maybe we should be more humble in how we think about the future and what we can and cannot do. And we allow interest rates to adjust so that people can make decisions knowing that the real world is here, that something isn't free, that you do have to pay interest uh, and you do have to make choices. And so what have I proposed? All right, so Tom, you've, uh, you've objected to this. Uh, now what would you do? And I certainly am not an advocate for, in any sense of the word, tight monetary policy. If that's defined as interest rates that are above what is uh, acceptable in the sense of causing uh, a, a contraction, a dramatic contraction economy, no way. But I am for non-zero. And what I have suggested is that, number one, we take away language that says, we guarantee you this rate for an extended period of time. So that people have to say, all right, let me think this all the way through. Let me, let me understand what my risks are. So we take that language away. Number two, I say, let's take the interest rate off of zero. Not bring it up dramatically, but let's get it off zero. A slight increase to begin with, let the markets get used to the idea, move it forward, move it towards 1%, then pause and see how the economy is doing, and then try and normalize it further towards 2%. Now, that's still an accommodative monetary policy. That still allows liquidity into the market and allows the economy to adjust to a more normal set of circumstances so that it doesn't get shocked at a later point. Not easy. Requires a lot of delicate balance, if you will, but it can be done. What would be the outcomes of that, perhaps? My, my, my estimate of what the outcomes might be. Well, number one, I think it would tell the world early on that we are not going to allow inflationary pressures to become embedded. We are, we are prepared to do that. Number two, we are not necessarily going to encourage imbalances that lead to bubbles, that lead to uh, bad outcomes for our nation and for segments of our nation. But number three, it would say, yes, but we're going to leave policy accommodative until our economy continues to rebuild and we're back on a solid foot, given, hopefully, that other fiscal policy actions are followed and implemented that are uh, consistent with long-term growth, and that our industrial policy, if there's such a thing, that allows businesses to grow, entrepreneurs to build businesses so that we have a future. That's the goal. Uh, now, others think that we can wait longer on that, and I respect that, but I disagree with it. I think we need to do that sooner. Because the other thing we know in monetary policy, that what we do today takes, there is an immediate effect, yes, an announcement effect, 
but all its effects take months, quarters, to be fully implemented. So the longer we wait, the longer the, uh, the, the more embedded the, the, uh, the inflationary impulses are in the economy, and the more difficult it is to, re, uh, to unwind those policies. So there's much to do, there's much to think about, there's much to discuss, because this is really as much a public issue as the debt. We're all affected by it. And so I think that's why the debate is good, why we need to have these discussions, not only among ourselves, but with the public and to engage the public. So with that, that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to stop here, and I would very much want to invite any questions that you have from the audience. And, and if not, then, then, boy, have I had it easy here. So any questions? <laughs> Hello, I'm going to say to Murphy for uh, those that were not at the earlier part. Um, again, I'm a senior in uh, management economics here at Purdue University, and um, I've again studied the what Mises Institute, uh, the Austrians, you said. And uh, you mentioned the debt, uh, and one, uh, I'm worried about that myself. It's been in the paper a lot, and I've looked into it. And uh, the governmental policy that's not part of the Fed. Right. So what is the possibility of hyperinflation, one, um, and at what point would it get to the point where the Fed can no longer do anything about it? Okay. Well, uh, I, did everyone hear the question? I couldn't tell if you were on the... Uh, it, it, basically, it's what, what about the debt and what, uh, what effect can the Fed have on that? Well, a couple things to make sure we have correct. The, the Federal Reserve cannot create debt. Only, only the federal government can do that. Now, what the federal, what the central banks can do, and what the Federal Reserve can do, is monetize the debt, and that's what you meant by inflation. And uh, yes, we can do that. We can, we can buy uh, long-term government debt uh, indirectly, which is as good as directly, and therefore uh, monetize the debt. Now, that's separate from the fact. Uh, that the government can increase debt, but it is very important in terms of the relationship. If the government continues to add its debt to its debt, uh, and we come against the ceiling, uh, that's one issue. And, and that issue is if we uh, don't raise the ceiling, then you will shut down the government. And that has a whole set of consequences. Uh, so what you have to do is uh, manage that debt and begin to reduce that debt, and that's the role of Congress and what it should do, and I hope it does that. Now, if they raise the debt ceiling and continue to increase the debt, then what you will see, I think, uh, potentially, is a, what happens is you, if, the, if the private sector economy is growing, and it is, it will need capital, it needs to be able to borrow, and the public sector, if it decides it wants to continue to grow as well, then what's called real interest rates have to rise because you're competing for limited resource, price has to rise, so that will come up. Now what happens is no one really talks about it in those terms. They say, well, interest rates are rising, the economy is slowing, the Fed has to do something, the Federal Reserve has to do something. It has to bring interest rates down. They don't say it has to buy the debt, it says it has to bring interest rates down. But the only way at that point you can bring interest rates down temporarily is to buy the debt, to monetize the debt. 
that's when the independence of the central bank and the resolve of the central bank has to come into play and say, no, we will not buy that debt. And that forces interest rates up, and then the public has to make some choices about whether they want a public good or the private sector to dominate. And that will be the debate that's ahead if, if the Congress and the administration don't come to an agreement on capping the deficit and then capping the debt and then reducing the debt over time as a percent of GDP. It's a huge challenge. A failure to address it means either very high interest rates and a slow economy or high inflation and a slow economy. There's no, that, that, is not a winning, that is not a winning solution at all. They have to begin to manage the debt. Okay, other questions? Hi there. Um, I have two questions. Sure. I'm assuming you want to stay within your district for my first question. I probably know more from there. <laughs> um, how does uh, the, your district uh, debt capacity on the farm side, the ag economy side, compare to uh, the middle part of the 80s when the farm crisis existed? And then the second question, let's roll forward a year from now. QE2, if the pool of credit that's out there right now, if nobody grabs it, does the Fed keep it out there? Uh, good questions. Uh, on the first question, what's the debt capacity in agriculture in our sector? Uh, our farm sector is, f at this point, modestly leveraged, uh, much less so than in the 80s. And so what you have going on, uh, the, and this is an overgeneralization, of course, but you have acquisitions being made uh, yeah, among operators. And they will actually, uh, their, their current debt level is fairly low, and that may be what's happening in, in Indiana as well. But anyway, their debt levels are fairly low. They buy the adjacent property or property nearby. They pay the top price, 10 grand an acre, or whatever it is. And they, um, they borrow 100% at a very good rate. And they spread that debt over all the property. So their loan to value is still fairly low right now. But that's a very uh, good outcome, right? Because land values go up, they made a lot of money. So what happens in that, just like it did in the 70s, is that's a sweetheart deal, so let's get another piece and let's leverage it. And the loan to value goes up a little more because you're leveraging uh, against that total property 100% on the new purchase, and now you're up to 60 or 70%. And if that gets too high over time, and it takes years, uh, but years, uh, isn't a long time in economics, frankly. And if interest rates then go up after they've leveraged up, then of course you have the repeat of the crisis of the 80s. Now we're not there yet. I, I, and my, you know, I'm not trying to be chicken little here and say the sky's falling. I'm saying be prudent because this is, if it's too good to be true, <laughs> it's not true. And that is you don't, you, you can't leverage indefinitely at zero interest rates and not have that come down on you. So that's, that's what I preach in our part of the country. And, Preach here too, as a matter of fact. The other thing, what about QE2? QE2, here's, what here's what's happening. Uh, as, you, as you begin, now what, what is QE2? Okay, QE2 is the Federal Reserve, the central bank, is purchasing systematically $600 billion of government debt in the secondary market, but purchasing it. Now, much of that is going into the, the government's coffers because that, that, that's already been loaned to them. But for those who are receiving the reserves from the Federal Reserve, as we buy this debt from the banks or whomever, it's going into what's called excess reserves. And our balance sheet, just so you know, was a uh, little less than a trillion dollars in 2008, is now going to three trillion dollars. So you have a lot of reserves in the system. Now, that, those reserves are idle, except that they're earning an interest rate uh, with the Federal Reserve, so there are earnings on that, but it is basically idle. If that were to suddenly be loaned out, then you would see further inflationary pressure go, but right now it's idle. If, if you do it right, you can withdraw that excess, the central bank can withdraw that excess very slowly over time so that it can't get loose uh, if, in terms of being an excess going out. Now, one of the fears uh, in among the professions today, both the finance and the banking and the economics profession, is that in the Great Depression, in, towards the end of the Depression, in 1937, 
36, 37, there was a buildup of excess reserves in the financial system, in the, um, among the banks. And the Open Market Committee and others were concerned that that would enter the, the economy and we'd have a rebuild of inflation at exactly the wrong time. Sounds familiar. And so the policymakers at that time uh, tried to withdraw that excess reserve, but here's what they did. They doubled the reserve requirements. So it was like hitting you in the face with a policy choice. They didn't slowly pull it out so that the market could adjust and people could anticipate and so forth. It just slammed them. So it put the economy into a second very serious recession in 1937, 1938. So yeah, we have to learn from that mistake. And my point is you do it, you, you, you first of all announce you're gonna stop guaranteeing everything and then you do a very modest increase so that your, your markets, your main street, your agriculture can begin to adjust to that. Because everyone, I mean, you, I, I talk to almost no one who thinks zero can last forever. And so it begins to let them know that the circumstances are changing, but that's also done in an environment where you say, that's not tight, we're not going to a tight policy. We're not gonna get the Fed funds rate to 6% over six months. We're gonna move it here and wait so that then the market's going to adjust. If we do that, then I think we can offset the risk of inflation further on and expectations about that uh, in the markets and, in, and on Main Street. So, other questions? Hi. Hi. I'm Tyler Sadek. I work for Taze River Investments. Um, Thanks so much. I was here for the panel earlier as well. I think everybody really benefited from everything you had to say. And uh, thanks for speaking out um, and actually voting uh, in the FOMC uh, commentary. Thank you. Um, my question has to do with unemployment and the dual mandate of the Fed. Sure. Um, I guess I, I have a little bit of a theory, and I, I'd like you to uh, comment on that sure. and then, and then love maybe ex expand on the <laughs> unemployment picture. Um, it seems to me that if, if you go through a normal business cycle or economic cycle, obviously you get an unemployment and then uh, you know, that comes through a natural rate of uh, employment and then you have that cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but under the current scenario, um, as my viewpoint would be that we're, we were and maybe still are in a deleveraging kind of debt spiral that you at the Fed are, are attempting to quell and hopefully will and have I don't know where we are on that, but um, I guess my point is at this point for most business owners and the decision to hire back people is quite different than a normal business cycle. We, um, we have significant manufacturing in the U.S. even though uh, if you read the news you'd believe otherwise. Right. Um, and I guess my, my, my comment there is, uh, is that productivity per person may be going up and therefore all these 35 million unemployed people, 35 million underemployed people um, may not have jobs to go back to even if you keep uh, rates accommodative. Uh, I guess what's your thought there and how do you balance that with, with your policy? Uh, well, uh, thank you for those five questions. <laughs> They're really good and, and I'm going to kind of go through them because they're all very good points that I happen to have an interest in. Uh, let, me, let me start with, not with unemployment, but let me start with the deleveraging question. Uh, it, it, is, it is really a significant issue in the U.S. and globally. And we have to deleverage, but we have to do it carefully, and that's, you're right, that's what the Federal Reserve is trying to get done without having a depression or a double dip recession. During the boom period when we had interest rates very low the first time, uh, the consumer leveraged up. They borrowed extensively. They, they basically uh, took their wealth, which was their house, and they borrowed against that wealth. And the debt to disposable income level went from well under 100% as a ratio to 125% as a ratio. So like 80% to 125%. Uh, roughly speaking, I don't have the number in front of me, but it borrowed extensively. Uh, and it had an interest carry on that, of course, like anything else. 